everyone, and welcome to Wellness Wednesday, presented by the University of Arizona Health Sciences. I'm Caroline Berger, Director of Corporate and Community Relations for Health Sciences in Phoenix. I'd like to introduce you to our amazing team, led by Allison O2, our Executive Director, and Anne-Marie Medina, who is our Director of Corporate and Community Relations in Tucson. We're a brand new team here and we welcome you and we thank you for joining us today. And we hope this provides a few minutes of respite for you and also provides some great health and wellness tips to help you in your everyday life. University of Health Sciences is led by Michael Dake, Dr. Michael Dake, our Senior Vice President. We invite you to join us and stay engaged with us. For more information, visit uahs.arizona.edu and be sure to follow us on social media and I invite you to follow me on Twitter at Caroline E. Berger. And be sure to include our hashtag for Wellness Wednesdays AZ as we want to spread the good news, good health, and good wealth to everyone. Today's session is interactive, so we invite you to leave a question in the chat section. We'll also be following up with you and sending you a post-session email, which will include a brief survey, and we welcome your thoughts and recommendations as well as links to all the resources and recommendations that you're gonna see presented here today. We're also gonna include a videotape of today's presentation. So please feel free to share this with friends, family, and colleagues and help us spread the good news. Today's session is optimizing your health, preventing and treating chronic disease with lifestyle medicine. Today, you will learn how to protect and boost your immune system through important lifestyle behaviors like diet, exercise, and sleep which I know I need some help with. Dr. Shad will also discuss how chronic illness can be a high risk factor for viruses and other medical conditions. Dr. Shad is the Associate Professor at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix, and Director of the Public Health Prevention and Population Health Promotion Theme, which is dedicated to understanding the connection between medicine and public health and the importance of prevention, nutrition, and healthy lifestyles to maintain wellness. Dr. Shad helped us launch our Wednesday, our Wellness Wednesday series in April, and we are so pleased to have him back again today. Please welcome Dr. Shad. Thank you, Caroline. <clears throat> I'm Dr. Shad. Thank you so much. Uh, great to be here. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can begin with the presentation for today. Um, this theme of um, maintaining our health, um, optimizing our health, despite the chronic diseases of our time. Um, and the challenges that we have is really more important than ever, I think, um, with the current uh, pandemic that's happening. And we'll learn a little bit more about why that is. And I'll be looking forward to answering your questions after I go through these slides. So when we talk about chronic disease, a chronic condition is really a physical or mental health condition that lasts more than one year and really causes functional restrictions or requires ongoing monitoring or treatment. So it's not something that like a, um, like a uh, sprain or strain, something that's very you know, short, kind of comes and goes and you're done with it. In fact, in the United States, 45% or almost half of all Americans suffer from at least one chronic disease. And we're actually the leader um, in the world with respect to chronic disease, which is not a good thing. Um, chronic disease um, actually accounts for 80, 81% of all hospital admissions. This is obviously data from before the coronavirus uh, and COVID-19. 91% of all prescriptions filled and 76% of all doctor's visits. And when you look at it in terms of the impact, chronic diseases, again, these are numbers before COVID-19, are, are responsible for seven out of every 10 deaths, killing more than 1.7 million Americans every year. And so we didn't, you know, shut down all the potential sources of, um, you know, bad food and, uh, you know, risk factors for chronic disease, right? When, you know, this has been going on for a long time. In fact, more than 75% of health care costs have been due to chronic conditions. And we could really isolate this down to three major diseases, actually. So cardiovascular disease or heart disease, cancer, diabetes, they basically are responsible for the vast majority of costs and deaths due to chronic disease. Now, this is problematic in a number of ways. Let's look at the maps in terms of where in the country we see these major diseases and some of the, some of them. Um, uh, I'm looking specifically, I'm gonna look at heart disease, uh, diabetes and obesity, which actually obesity increases your risk for 
poor health outcomes across the board. It's also a chronic condition. Um, so take a quick look at this map. You can see kind of where the distribution of heart disease is by county throughout the country. Ah, and here is obesity epidemiology. So very similar distribution in terms of the parts of the country that are affected. And then we also see diabetes. So if you look at it, similar parts of the country around the country are affected in these three conditions. And now let's look at one that's very current. This is COVID-19 cases per capita in tracking. So we're seeing increased numbers even in COVID-19. And that's also interesting. We're 5% of the world's population, yet we have 25% of all COVID-19 deaths. One of the reasons for this, there's a number of different reasons for this, and we're going to keep learning more in the weeks and months and years ahead why this is. But one of the reasons is because of our chronic disease burden, because we lead the world in chronic disease. And having a chronic disease actually puts you in a high-risk category for getting sick to the point of requiring oxygen and being hospitalized with a COVID-19 infection. So chronic disease is actually really important to get a handle on, both in terms of prevention as well as treatment. And in fact, the good news is, even though chronic diseases are chronic long-term, they stay with us, many and most of them in many ways can be prevented, delayed, or even completely alleviated through simple lifestyle changes. Uh, a recent article in New England Journal of Medicine found that people with chronic conditions receive only 56% of the recommended preventive health care services. So the screenings that they need to get, all of those things that are key to preventing and maintaining. So we're not getting access to care. And incidentally, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, most folks have avoided going into the doctor's office. Thankfully, we now have the option of virtual care. I have that in my own practice. Other, most doctors, hospital health systems have that. So I encourage everybody, don't delay getting vaccinations Don't for your kids. Don't delay getting screenings that you need to get for health because there are protective measures in place, at least get a, that virtual visit going to make sure that you're addressing your chronic conditions. And when it comes to lifestyle, this is really powerful. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate that eliminating just three risk factors, poor diet, inactivity, physical inactivity, and smoking would prevent 80% of heart disease and stroke, 80% of type two diabetes, and 40% of cancer. If there was a medication that could do that, it would be off the charts in terms of the number of sales that it would have and the number of people that would be taking it. Everybody would be prescribing that medication. Yet, all there has, it goes down to is our lifestyle. And so this really points to a really important point, I think, um, is optimizing health with prevention. If we look at a graph, and this is a hypothetical graph looking at percent functionality, okay, based on kind of where we are and our age and years. If we have a reactive disease management after the fact, we wait until we get sick approach to healthcare, right? A real sick care system. We continue to decline. You add in through here, like the standard American diet, which is sad, mostly processed foods, lack of physical activity. Uh, a lot of the risk factors like high blood pressure, high blood sugar, um, you know, all those contribute to kind of this functional decline over time when we start getting sick, we have a chronic disease, you're in and out of the hospital and you're losing functionality, you're losing quality of life. But if you focus on prevention and actually making those healthy habits something that's a key part of your daily life in terms of eating well, living well with your physical activity, having good, meaningful, authentic relationships, you can shift that curve to more of a prevention model. And, and so the goal of prevention is not to cure disease, but to push it back for as far back in the lifestyle as we can, lifespan as we can, otherwise known as morbidity compression. We increase the period of disease-free quality life, and we push this curve to the right. So I'm gonna talk briefly about some of the major diseases of our time and how you can push that curve to the right for those conditions. And then I'm gonna open it up to questions. So heart disease, that's one of the biggest ones. It's the number one killer in women. 80 million Americans have cardiovascular disease. Here's some of the stats, one death every 37 seconds. Literally number one cause of death. Obviously COVID-19 is overshadowing that at the moment, but people with heart disease and hypertension are at increased risk of getting really sick if they have COVID-19. So it's still very important not to ignore the fact that we have these chronic diseases. 
Well, there's certain risk factors that you can't change, right? Your age is gonna to continue to go forward. Um, having a premature history in your family, a first degree female relative less than 65 or a first degree male relative less than 55. And there are disparities among ethnic groups. As you know, the similar thing we see with COVID-19, for example, African-Americans dying much at a higher rate, two to three or four times, depending on what part of the country you look at with COVID-19, heart disease is also 30% higher. Well, I say non-modifiable in terms of age and premature family history, but these disparities in health equity inequities are modifiable. And that's something that we have to educate our, ourselves on and be able to advocate for public health change to be able to address those inequalities in healthcare. The key things in a lifestyle perspective that are modifiable and preventable for this deadly disease of heart disease is whether you smoke or not, controlling your blood pressure, whether you do it through the DASH diet, which is proven clinically to lower blood pressure, which basically is higher in fruits, vegetables, and fiber, okay, and lower in sodium, or medication, right? There's great medications that actually help. And that's, you know, those of us who are trained in integrative medicine, I was trained, fellowship trained to the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. We see the best of both worlds, doing evidence-based supplements, lifestyle, exercise, nutrition, as well as medications. Cholesterol levels, uh, whether you're overweight, all of these things are risk factors that you can change. You actually have a power to do that. Just to review, these risk factors are what leads to the development of plaques in our arteries. And this, this graph where I'm showing from healthy artery to a plaque rupturing, this usually takes multiple decades to occur, right? It's not something that happens in one to two months or one to two years. It's 10 to 20 years. So you can't catch a heart attack like you catch a cold. It's something that you can prevent by preventing and modifying those risk factors over time. And if we think that it's just about your numbers in terms of blood pressure, cholesterol, or your weight, it's also about your mental health. A number of studies, this was one of the bigger ones, have shown that actually stress is critical to primary prevention of heart, heart attacks and strokes. The amount of negative stress that you have in your life, if you're a victim of systematic uh, structural racism as a black American, for example, that contributes to this as well as um, any other kind of stress like financial problems, marital issues, other things that are going on in life that you're not quite resolving, psychosocial stress is actually responsible for up to 32% of the risk for this. Mental health um, is really critical too. In fact, depression is an independent risk factor for heart disease. Folks who have a heart attack or stroke, if they have untreated depression, they're three times more likely to have another heart attack within two years, okay, or a stroke. So treating depression is also critical. And the best thing in terms of diet that we know is the Mediterranean diet. It's been extensively studied. It basically consists of more vegetables, more fruit, more whole grains, more wild seafood, less refined carbs, no processed food, less red meat, and a predominant use of extra virgin olive oil as a finishing oil. Now be careful with using olive oil. You don't wanna just cook with it at high heat because it has a low smoke point. And when the oil, if any oil gets damaged, that low smoke point damaged oil can actually oxidize the cholesterol in your, in your body and actually cause the cascade of inflammation that leads to heart attacks and strokes. So you wanna use it more as a finishing oil. Again, as a review, um, we don't really talk, I'm not gonna have that much time to talk about it, but we have, can talk about this more in the questions and I'm happy to continue engaging with you guys. The different types of fats are important. Um, good fats actually are important for a good heart. And this is the summary. So mon monounsaturated fats, for example, that are in, um, in avocados, in almonds, um, in a uh, number of other nuts as well. These, and also dark chocolate, by the way, lowers your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol, and raises your good cholesterol, which is your HDL. Um, we also have PUFAs, which are like your omega-3s and omega-6s. Omega-3 in particular lowers triglyceride levels. That's why even taking fish oil can lower your triglyceride levels. Saturated fat is not as good here in terms of heart disease. It does raise your HDL, which is your good cholesterol, but it also raises your bad cholesterol, which is LDL. And trans fat, which is found in processed food, is bad all around because it raises the numbers in the wrong direction. So to summarize, for optimizing your heart health, you wanna have healthy fats for a healthy heart, not no fat. Low fat is code for high sugar and high processed foods. So you want healthy fats 
for a healthy heart. You want to avoid bad fats, avoid refined sugar, exercise, learn to manage stress, avoid excess anger, get enough sleep. Actually, every hour of sleep uh, is actually connected with lowering risk for heart attack and stroke uh, if you have more than five hours and less than, in less than 10 hours. So get enough sleep and keep good mental health. Let's look at another major disease factor as we're looking at chronic diseases. Let's look at diabetes. 30 million people have diabetes. That's 9%, nearly 10% of the US population. What's really crazy about this is that of this 30 million, 7.2 million don't even know they have diabetes. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to see your doctor, get tested, check your blood sugar. If you're wondering if you have it, right? If you have some of the symptoms, like feeling thirsty, having to pee all the time. These are some of the symptoms of diabetes actually, or how it runs in your family. You can get a blood sugar monitor, you can get your check tested. Here's another number, 84 million people have pre-diabetes, okay? And a number of these actually, and I didn't include it on here, 60 million of them don't even know they have pre-diabetes. So that's really important. So diabetes, basically there's two types. There's type one and then there's type two. Type one is really only five to 10% of cases. It's mostly because of autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cells, which are the cells in your pancreas that secrete insulin to lower the blood sugar levels, okay? That's only five to 10% of all cases. Type two diabetes is actually the vast majority. When we talk about diabetes, 90 to 95% is type two, and that's due to insulin resistance, okay? That's due to having repeated high levels of blood sugar which your body, if, if insulin is like shock absorbers, right? For the shock of having high blood sugar, the shock absorbers start wearing off and they don't work as well. And that's what causes insulin resistance and diabetes. So the common pathway to that, which actually is a common pathway to heart disease, diabetes, and obesity is something called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome, you need to have three of these five things. One is abdominal fat. We found that the metabolically most active unhealthy fat to have is belly fat. Of all the fat, that's the fat that's associated with the worst disease outcomes in terms of getting hospitalized or dying. So if there's any part of your body that you need to work on the fat, it's your waist, circ your waist circumference and looking at your abdominal fat. High triglycerides, that's also linked to simple carbs and, and sugars and insulin resistance. Low HDL, which is a good cholesterol, the way you can raise the low the HDL, which is a good cholesterol, is through aerobic exercise, which also is good for your arteries and your heart and also decreases stress. And did you know that exercise is actually medicine for depression? For mild to moderate depression, it's clinically the same as an SSRI, okay? So you should add that. If you, even if you're on a medication for depression, you should also add exercise to it. It'll, if you do aerobic, it'll increase your HDL, which also help protect your heart from getting a heart attack or stroke lowering your blood pressure, which we talked about. And then of course, metabolic syndrome is part of prediabetes when you have that fasting blood sugar between 100 to 125. So how do we get diabetes? We have this thing, metabolic syndrome. You have repeat cycles of excess sugar without adequate fiber that causes spikes in insulin levels, okay? So the sugar spikes, the insulin spikes, and then when you don't know what to do, your body doesn't know what to do with this excess sugar. If you're a marathon runner, right? You need to drink Gatorade because you're running, right? Otherwise, unless you're a professional athlete, you don't have any business drinking Gatorade or something like that, unless you're sick and you, you need it for medicinal purposes. Because all that extra sugar, what happens to it, it just gets turned into fat. It turns into triglycerides. It gets into that belly fat through a, a mechanism, fatty acid synthase, which your body has to do something with the sugar. So it contributes to fat production. It leads to diabetes. And then the excess sugar that's just bumping around in diabetes starts damaging arteries, which leads to blindness, which leads to poor circulation, which leads to infections and amputations, right? That's why diabetes is one of the leading causes of amputations, uh, right? Uh, as well as kidney disease. So it's really bad. And also this extra sugar damages your LDL, which basically oxidizes it, which leads to heart attacks and strokes. So this is kind of the summary looking at like the impact of all this stuff in terms of our behavior. Going specifically to diabetes, like I said, type one does really little to no connection with diet, although your diet can uh, impact how much insulin you have to take, right? There's some connections that we've now seen with vitamin D levels actually 
with some people having increase of uh, autoimmunity in getting uh, type 1 diabetes, but we're focusing more on type 2. The food choices that we make is really critical to this. So how rapidly a food is broken down into simple sugar, basically when you eat foods that are refined, like refined carbs, refined sugars, uh, versus eating those that are whole grains, beans, seeds, berries, nuts, things like that. So the key here is it's all about the fiber. So when you do this excess sugar consumption, this is basically diabetes type two in a nutshell. Rapid release, increased blood sugar level, insulin spikes, and then what happens is the extra um, sugar that you don't use gets basically, if you're active, it gets used for energy. If not, it forms fat and it ultimately leads to diabetes, okay? The key here is juice versus whole fruit. So one thing to really keep in mind, how many of you, and you can think about this as a thought experiment, have you squeezed your own glass of orange juice, right? Usually it takes about five or six or more oranges, depending on how juicy they are. But if you actually had to peel that orange and eat it with all the fibrous connective tissue, you usually can only eat one or two oranges at a sitting. That's because of the fiber. What the fiber does is it causes distension in your stomach, and that distension sends a signal to your brain that says, I'm full, so it controls your portion size. The other thing it does, it slows down the breakdown of the sugars. So orange juice causes a rapid jump in your blood sugar levels. But orange, especially if you combine it with a handful of nuts or seeds, which are healthy fats and proteins, has a gradual increase in blood sugar levels. So you don't get that spike that causes insulin to spike, which breaks down your shock absorbers and eventually leads to diabetes. So really the key here is combining good fats and good carbs together and mitigating and keeping that fiber. Average fiber intake 100 years ago was over 50 grams. Average fiber intake now in the standard sad American diet is five to seven grams. Incidentally, that fiber is also the main food for our microbiome, the good bacteria in our gut. So this has impact all around. The other thing is that you might think, oh, well, I'll just drink diet soda or I'll just drink diet foods, right? No, think again because diet soda has actually been studied with diabetes and it's actually worse for diabetics and also leads to more diabetes than regular soda. So all soda is really, and the reason why is it disrupts our endocrine system and it throws off your, your body signaling. And, and now we're also learning that aspartame, for example, which is in a lot of diet soda products, actually damages the microbiome, the good bacteria in our gut. So a lot of things to think about. In my practice, one of the things I specialize in is in health optimization, now mostly practicing virtually because of the pandemic. We see really great examples of folks coming in with really uncontrolled A1C. Those of you who are diabetic, pre-diabetic, have someone in your family, you see that 10.6 can go down to as little as 5.9 within three or four months. This is just through lifestyle. This is very powerful medicine. Food is medicine. At the U of A, we have a whole culinary medicine program. Our students doing all sorts of stuff. Um, we're hoping to develop a teaching kitchen at some point here in College of Medicine Phoenix. Um, so we'll keep trying to do more lifestyle. So again, summarizing for optimal blood sugar control, eat real food with fiber, avoid juice, sugary beverages, and diet drinks, combine healthy fats and proteins with healthy whole grain carbs, avoid refined carbs and processed foods, stay active, exercise, keep a healthy weight, walk a little after a meal, actually five minutes of walking, after a meal, lowers your blood sugar. Add vinegar. Two teaspoons of vinegar, make it in salad dressing with extra virgin olive oil. Don't buy store-bought salad dressing, make your own. With that healthy fat, that vinegar, vinegar actually lowers blood sugar, okay? It's similar to many medications. Try it, if you're diabetic, check it out, message me. Let me know what, what, how it works. I'm just gonna summarize a little bit of high points for cancer and obesity, and then we're gonna open it up to questions because we don't have time. We could do a talk on each one of these. We could do one on heart disease, we could do one on diabetes, we could do one on it, maybe we'll do it in the future. Optimal cancer prevention. Eat more plant-based. What we know with cancer prevention is avoiding excess red meat, avoiding smoking, exercising, avoiding excess alcohol, and eating mostly plants. So the foods that cause cancer is either excess caloric intake, it's so actually eating too much. We found that food restriction not only improves aging, right, but it also improves, improves cancer development. Um, charred meats, blackened meats is also carcinogenic. Pickled, smoke, and salt cured foods, um, the nitrosamine products, and even aflatoxins in certain cereal products. 
So the strongest evidence exists for protective effect of fiber rich, nutrient dense plant foods. So eat the rainbow. And great resources, the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research. They have this nice little graphic, which basically shows you, summarizes all the things that you can do to let, let prevent cancer. Optimal healthy weight, avoid processed foods, avoid liquid calories. Liquid calories fool the body, okay? We don't actually get the nutrients we need. And it actually shows that people who have a lot of calories coming from liquid calories tend to eat more and, are, and tend to gain and keep weight on more. Diet products as well, staying active, controlling your portion size, eating for quality, not quantity, right? For example, just to give you an example, they've done studies where they looked at the same amount of calories, one group, right? Same number of calories in both of these groups. One of these groups had a higher percentage of their calories coming from monounsaturated fat, right? In avocados, almonds, pecans, extra virgin olive oil. The group with the higher percent, same number of calories, higher percentage of good fats, they lost belly fat. They actually became thinner. So it's the quality of your calories that also matters, okay? And sugar actually makes you fat, healthy fats make you thin. And more beans, vegetables, and fish, and less meat and animal products, because animal proteins tend to pack on and keep weight off. Anti-inflammatory diet is a good summary way of thinking about how to eat well, how to use your food as medicine. These are some of the key points. And then remember, most chronic diseases can be prevented with changes in lifestyle diet, exercise, mental health, social interactions. There was a big study out of Harvard that was done a few years ago that looked at meaningful, authentic relationships as being the key factor above cholesterol, above power, wealth, status, in terms of developing health outcomes and happiness in life. So having a sense of purpose and meaning, goals, spirituality, and consistent pattern of healthy habits. The key thing I'll leave you with here is to start. All we have to do sometimes is just start. Specific goals, begin for example, start walking three times per week, make it time limited. I'm gonna do it for 15 minutes at 7 a.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the next seven days. Make sure it's achievable. A lot of times we do too much too quickly. If it's greater than seven on a 10 point scale of your likelihood to do it, behavior change science shows that you're gonna do it. If it's lower than that, Go for a, a less lofty goal. Make it something more easy to attain. Then assess, did it work? Did you accomplish your goal? Then repeat it. Do the same thing the next week. Gain momentum. Start low, go up slow, and build that momentum towards successful behavior change. And then you're going to start establishing healthy habits. Just like avoiding excess salt, for example, any food that you change, your taste buds change in a matter of weeks. Our genes Expression also can change in a matter of weeks depending on what we eat and how active we are. And the final step, try harder, add something else. So please keep in touch with me. We're gonna open it up to questions uh, available through my website, drshaw.com and all sorts of social media stuff and sessions to come uh, engaging folks as well. Very good, thank you. Such great information that we have there. Um, a couple of questions that we have. I use liquid enhancer, i.e. Kool-Aid, to add to my water. Is this healthy? Uh, it's probably not as much. You need to look at the chemical uh, composition, whether it has aspartame or something else. I have to look at the actual product. But if you want to do something to add to your water, lime juice, like actually fresh squeezed lime is good. Or you can actually put a, make a diffuser process by actually adding real fruits. If you actually store, like put berries or cucumbers, mint, whatever you like, and just leave it in the water for a few hours, it'll start to develop that flavor. And so if you get a nice big um, tank, you know, to put your water and do that, and then you can kind of drink from it all through the day. And it's actually much better than adding something like that. A great tip. And it also is good for children too. It encourages them to drink yeah. some more water and stay hydrated as well. Absolutely. Another question. We char our beef brisket ends when we barbecue. Is this healthy or unhealthy? Unhealthy. Absolutely unhealthy. Uh, it increases your risk for a number of different cancers. Uh, they've actually found that women who have had a history of breast cancer, who eat, eat more meat that's well done or charred, have an increased chance of getting breast cancer recurrent because of that. So the, the compounds in that charred part of the meat is not good. Avoid charring it. 
You can even um, put some olive oil on it. Um, if you're not cooking at a very high heat, that can also help a little bit for protection of it. But I would just avoid charring your meat. Don't char, or if you char it, don't eat the charred part. Take off that part of it and eat the other parts. Take off that part. Okay. Is flaxseed oil as good as fish oil? Um, so they have different purposes. So I think you're trying to get at the omega-3. And so some people lack an enzyme to convert uh, alpha linoleic acid um, to omega-3s so that's bioactive, which is the way you get it through plants like walnuts and flax. Um, the fish oil is a bit more effective. Uh, we know for a fact in terms of being more researched and studied, um, but it's not going to be harmful for you to have the flaxseed. The key with flaxseed oil, though, I would say in all oils and any supplements like omega-3 or vitamin D that are fat-based, you need to refrigerate them because the oils can go rancid and oxidize. So you definitely want to keep those in the refrigerator. Flaxseed oil can t uh, taste like uh, turpentine, you know, like paint thinner when it's gone bad. So if the taste of flaxseed oil changes and it's gone bad and you want to avoid that. So keep it in the refrigerator and, and that's, that's just a tip for that. Okay. What about saccharin or stevia as sweeteners or what about agave or maple syrup as substitutes? Great question. So the best is to eat whole fruits, right? And sweeten with whole fruit whenever possible. Like if you're making a banana bread, put bananas in there or something, right? After that, it's actually in terms of the blood sugar impact of, of, the, um, of, the, of the food in terms of the impact on your blood sugar is, it's gonna be um, maple syrup, okay? Then it's gonna be raw honey. Um, and I would avoid agave um, because agave really raises blood sugar. If you're gonna do agave, I'd rather de develop, you develop a taste for, um, for uh, either maple syrup or raw honey uh, to sweeten because agave really jumps up your blood sugar. Stevia, saccharin is not, uh, it's been shown in laboratory animals to, to lead to cancer and other issues. So saccharin is not something I would, I would recommend. But stevia so far has been shown to be relatively safe, depending on how processed it is. And in fact, they've done studies with stevia and vinegar drinks uh, for diabetics, which have shown them to actually reduce their blood sugar levels. Uh, so uh, of all of those, I would say stevia, but then try to sweeten with whole, uh, uh, whole fruit if you can. And then the hierarchy is maple syrup, raw honey, and agave, I, I really would, you know, I don't really like it as much because it raises your blood sugar too much. Monk fruit is good too, I see that in the comments. Okay, one last question. What is the recommended vitamin D supplement dosage? So it depends on what your vitamin D level is. So vitamin C, vitamin B12, the B vitamins, those are all water soluble vitamins. So you basically pee them out, right? So you can't really get to toxic levels. So it's pretty easy to just start taking some and see how you feel, okay? Vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin A, these are all fat soluble vitamins. So they can actually get accumulated in your body to toxic levels. So you really wanna check your vitamin D level first before really taking a vitamin D regularly. If you're gonna start with vitamin D3, you wanna go with very low, probably 1000 IU or 2000 IU would be safe without checking, but I wouldn't do that for very long without checking your levels because you may have supplemented at some point it may get too high. And even if you do have low vitamin D, which by the way, most people do, even in Arizona, ironically, a number of us are vitamin D deficient. Um, and so taking, getting your vitamin D level checked and even new studies have actually shown vitamin D levels less than 30 to be associated with poor outcomes with a COVID-19 infection with increased risk for getting sicker and hospitalized. So that's something we're learning about. So vitamin D is really important, I think. Um, but making sure to know what your level is and then checking that is how you can determine what dose is the right for you. Very good. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation today. Um, just a reminder to everyone tuning in, we will be sending you all the information, including all of our contact information. And then we invite you to join us for next week, July 8th already, where we're going to talk about the impact of social isolation on mental health. So as always, we thank you for joining us for our Wellness Wednesdays. We invite you and encourage you to stay healthy, mask up, and bear down. Thank you. Thank you.